Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Today is going to be my last Q of Ember entry in the Sinclair QL, but specifically we're going to be looking at microdrives. What are they? How do they work? And are they really as bad as they're made out to be? So next, let's try to use the microdrives. After all, that's one of the most unique characteristics of the Sinclair QL. So what exactly is a microdrive? A microdrive is a tape-based storage technology. Unlike a cassette tape, the microdrive is aware of where all the files are and will seek them itself without the user having to search for them. Microdrive cartridges are pretty small and inside each cartridge there's a single loop of tape. The microdrive unit itself has a motor and a single roller to move the tape. So how can it move both ways with just one roller, you may be asking yourself? Well, it can't. It just goes in a single direction, just like 8-track tapes. There are 5 meters of tape, and it can hold about 100 kilobytes. That doesn't seem much compared to 360K on a single density 5 and a quarter disc. They could have probably made longer tapes, but that would come with a trade-off. The motor moves the tape at 75 centimeters per second, and there are 5 meters of tape, so that makes that a full loop of the tape takes about 7 seconds, which is actually your worst case if you're trying to access something that you just passed with a read head. So if you made the tape twice as long, the worst case access time would also double. 7 seconds is kind of okay, but 14 seconds is firmly in the annoying category. So why did Sinclair go with microdrives instead of floppy disk drives, since that was clearly the emerging standard at the time? In part, it's because they had already manufactured that technology for the ZX Spectrum, but mostly it was because it was cheaper than floppy disk drives and Sinclair really wanted to compete in the price point with PCs and Macs. Interestingly, apart from reliability issues, which we'll talk about those later, microdrive cartridges ended up being expensive to manufacture for third parties, only Sinclair could manufacture them because the QL drives weren't reliable enough to mass copy thousands of copies that you needed to do if you were a publisher or a developer targeting the QL. So that might have had something to do with lack of third-party support. So every QL machine came with two micro drives and potentially you could chain other micro drives. And yeah, these go in, obviously you would have the top case. These go in like this. And so this is the head that reads the microdrive, and then this is the motor that spins the microdrive very quickly. <laughs> Just from a purely design point of view, this would kind of drive me crazy that they don't go in straight. You push it in, and then you really need to put it at an angle before it clicks into place. So that's a little weird. An important part of the microdrive is this spongy foam that it has over here, actually just like a cassette tape, and that makes it so that the tape itself can make good contact against the reed head, like that. Like It just presses it a little bit so it makes contact all around. I'm saying that because those spongy bits are notoriously delicate and over time, they tend to break and come off very easily. And one of the worst things that can happen is if while the unit is working, it comes off and then somehow it gets sucked into the inside. And that would be um, that would be it for this particular microdrive tape. So it's not a bad idea to replace those or at least check if they need replacement. If, if you touch them and they quickly come undone, then they probably need replacement. This one seemed totally fine, so let's see if we can get it to work. I was so used to other operating systems that I typed dir, and then I realized that no, you need to type which microdrive you want to get a directory from afterwards. But we're getting that not found error, which doesn't look good. Let's try moving the microdrive cartridge to the second unit. Okay, that worked great, and we got the directory contents, so I wonder if the first drive is not working. I thought maybe that wasn't a big deal, and I would try running it directly from the second drive, but it looks like some programs are hardwired to only run from microdrive 1, so we need to fix this. 
The first thing is to make sure the roller is nice and clean and in good shape. So I gave it a quick rub with isopropyl alcohol and, and the, the cotton came a little dirty, but nothing much in there really. As I suspected, that made no difference whatsoever. So let's try swapping the two micro drives. Both of them are identical. There's nothing key to one or two. So we can just swap them and see if it's a problem with the micro drives or something in the board that controls them. Let's try this again. So this one should work in drive one. And great, it does. And now let's swap it to drive two. And it fails right away, just like before. So it's definitely the drive. Before we start with anything complicated, let's just clean the head really well to make sure that's not the problem. Also, even though the roller looks just fine, I'm going to take it out and I'm going to put it back in upside down. That's because I read that it often gets worn unevenly. So if that's the case, putting it upside down should probably fix this problem. Well, that wasn't it. So now let's make sure the 7805 voltage regulator is working correctly. So let's see, this should be the input. Yep, that's nine volts. And the output should be exactly five. Yep, 5.1, that's, that's good enough. Let's compare with this one. I'll just get ground in here, it's easier. Yep, 5.1. So. That's not the problem. So it's looking more and more like the problem with this micro drive is the ULA. At this point, I think we can rule out a mechanical failure, at least from the tests we've done. And it's looking more and more likely that the problem is the ULA that comes with the micro drive itself. So let's run a few more tests and see if we can isolate that problem. The QL service manual has a great section on micro drive fault finding. It first recommends doing some mechanical checks, which we've done all of them already, the roller, checking that the heads are clean and all of that. But then it has a second part looking specifically at some of the signals at the ULA. For that, they have a basic program that simply writes a 100 kilohertz signal to the microdrive itself and then continuously reads it back. Then they recommend looking at the signals at some specific pins of the ULA and those signals need to match the description on the service manual. The first thing we need to do is type the program. It's not very long, but I have a little helper that will help me with it. What I've done here is I've set up the two probes of the oscilloscope to go to pins 24 and 19, I believe, on the ULA of the second micro drive. Those are the pins for data one and data two, which are the alternating data channels that are being written to or read from the micro drive cartridge itself. So let's go ahead and need to, so I already typed it earlier and now I need to load it from here. It's a little tricky with a keyboard over here. Okay. Oh, interesting. Right, this makes sense. We're seeing the signals for data one and data two, even though I only have those connected to micro drive two and we're loading that from micro drive one. The reason we're seeing that is because those are common. So the QL can only read or write from one of the drives at once. So we actually get to see what the shape of those signals looks like for a good micro drive. And they look very, very square, very, very neat and perfect. So I'm gonna take this out because I don't want to be writing to this cartridge and I'm just gonna put another one. So now I'll tell the test program that we want to be using drive two. And as soon as the presenter, this is gonna start. So I think. So here we have the two channels, the uh, data one and data two. They should have very similar signals. I think they're just like slightly offset because they're interleaved. And we are first going to see the data that the QL is writing to the drive. So if, the, if we don't see square waves pretty much in both, then there's a problem with how we're writing to the drive. And then it's going to beep and it's going to start reading back so if the signal changes, then the problem is with the reading. Okay, so let's give this a try. So that's the writing, and we get clear signal in both of them. 
And in a second, we're gonna, there we go. Now we get the beeping, and now we're reading, and there's nothing on this channel. So data two looks totally fine, but data one, it looks like there's absolutely nothing there. So that definitely points towards a potential bad ULA. Let's actually do the same thing with microdrive one, since we know that one is working. So I'm going to switch the cartridge over to here. And again, we're gonna be able to see data one and data two because those are common. It doesn't matter that I'm attached to that one in particular. So I'm gonna tell it to use drive one and let's see. So we're writing just like before. It's interesting that we don't see them offset, I expect them. And there you go. So when we read back, we have that square wave in both of them. Let me do a capture. It gives her slightly offset, not completely, which actually that's probably what I would expect because it's almost writing in parallel. So that makes sense. By the time it's done with this one, it starts with that one. So that makes sense. So that's what a healthy one is supposed to look like. So the next recommendation from the technical manual is to look at the signals coming out of pins four and five out of the ULA, or I think 14, 15, if you're looking at the other, um, sort of the, the, the other segment of the ULA that deals with data two. And I believe those are signals closer to what's actually being read or written to the head. So that gives you an idea of whether the problem is getting those signals from the head or the actual amplification. So I have it hooked up in there and let's go ahead and, um, and see what happens. So I have this hooked up to micro drive one. So the one that is working correctly, I want to see what those signals look like in a healthy drive and then we'll move them over to drive two and check that. Unlike data one and data two, those are not shared. So I do have to move them back and forth. So let's try it with this one. The scale, by the way, is different. And actually I think there's a different scale for reading and for writing. So I think I'm supposed to put all the way to one volt for scale for writing. And then it looks like the reading is a smaller, uh, smaller signal. So there we go. So that is the writing. So that makes alternate signals. That makes sense. And then the reading, yes, that's much smaller. We need to drop down to 50 millivolts and I am in AC coupling because this has an AC offset. And I mean, you can kind of see that. The manual specifically asks to look at the difference between the two. So I have this ready in the math menu. I'm going to turn off signal one and turn off signal two and turn on the difference between one and two. And that's a lot cleaner. And make sure this is, and they recommend that at 50 millivolts. And that's exactly what the technical manual says we should be getting. So now let's look at that same thing on the micro drive two, the one that is faulty. Okay, here we are hooked up to pins four and five of the ULA of the second micro drive. And specifically that is the data one half of the ULA. And data one is the one that we were seeing a failing signal from the read part. So let's see, we're gonna do the right. So I need to adjust this to one volt like earlier. Okay. And let's, I need to, I need to run the test on the second drive. So there we go. We don't see anything. There's absolutely nothing there. 
and then the reading. That's pretty much nothing. Wow. The weird thing is that I didn't see that in either read, in either one, all oh, right, because this is data one. This is data one, it's not data two. And there was nothing in either one of them. Just to make really sure, I'm going to probe one of those two just by hand. I don't want, sometimes these are not very good connectors. Sometimes they will not make connection there. And then, you know, we're, we're dealing with such low voltages and small signals that I guess it's possible. So I'm going to do that by hand, which means I need to turn it off first. Okay. So I'm just holding it by hand to make sure there isn't a bad contact. And I need to reach over the keyboard. That's the writing and we should be seeing really much bigger signal than that. Like that's just the noise and notice how it made absolutely no difference there in reading mode. So yeah, it just looks like whatever we're sending to the ULA, it's not generating any signals. And then of course it's not reading any signals back. So that to me means it's not the head because that's always a possibility, the head or, you know, something else. But it's definitely the ULA. We tell the ULA to write something in data one and it's not doing anything. So it looks like we should definitely replace the ULA in the micro drive. Now this is not a chip you can easily find available. It's a, it's a ULA, so it's a custom chip that um, Sinclair produced for this. But there's still spares out there. And I was lucky enough that Chris from the QL forum sent me one along with a very nice note. Thank you so much, Chris. So here's the replacement one. So one thing I noticed is that we can't put a socket, for example, because these micro drives fit very tightly in place. There's no extra room at all for a socket. The other problem is that the read write head seems to be attached soldered directly to the board. There's no connectors or screws for that. We can either remove the head from here, but that might be much more delicate especially because I don't really have access to the bottom. Yeah, so I'm thinking we should probably desolder the head from there. And then hopefully when we put it back in, everything will be in the same position. And then we have some cables here for the micro switch. And maybe I'm, I'm gonna try leaving those in place. Maybe we can just take the board and sort of move it to the side enough to desolder that and put the new ULA. So I'm not gonna do anything with that for now. And this seems delicate enough that I'm just going to use a desoldering braid instead of the usual desoldering gun. We'll save that for the ULA. I'm going to go ahead and remove the micro switch just to have more room to maneuver over here. These wires are pretty tight. Yeah, much easier. Just need to carefully check that all the connectors for the head are loose. Oh, there we go. Okay. See, there's another cable there. Yeah. But this is, this is enough. This is all we need to desolder the ULA. I have to say that was one of the toughest integrated circuits I have desoldered so far. The combination of the really short legs and the super cramped board, that made it quite difficult. And like I said earlier, we can't really use a socket, which is too bad. Now we need to reassemble the head. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. There we go.
Time to reassemble it and test it. Let's put a cartridge that we know it's working on microdrive 2 and let's request a directory in it. That sounds better already before you give us an error right away. And there you go, we get the contents just fine, so it was definitely the ULA and this microdrive is working. Looking through the different cartridges I have, I found one that doesn't have a felt padding at all. Apparently it just fell away over time, hopefully not inside the cartridge itself. This is what the felt pad is supposed to look like, it just sits on top of that metal piece. So let's try to make a replacement. I bought some thin felt with adhesive backing. The ones sold online are usually really thick because they're intended for furniture, but this one was aimed at a smaller item, so I thought it would be okay. But now that I look at it, I think it may still be a little too thick, so we'll see once we put it there. We'll start by cutting a piece of about the right size, it doesn't have to be exact. And yeah, this looks definitely too thick, so I'm just going to carefully cut the top a bit to make it thinner. Yeah, that's better. If this is adhesive backing, I can't figure out how to peel the protective plastic, so I'm just going to glue it with a drop of super glue and being extra careful not to drop any inside the cartridge, or that will be the end of it. A couple of hours have gone by, so that should be totally set by now. Let's try it. Let's start by formatting it. Okay, that seemed to work. We got some bad sectors, but I know by now that that's supposed to be normal. And it looks like we can get a directory listing back from it. So that seems to have worked. Unfortunately, right after that, I went to use the cartridge and this is what I got. It spins and spins and spins and it never returns. So maybe that's not working as well as I thought. I did read that some felt pads attract static electricity and that prevents the head from reading correctly. So maybe this is one of those felts. Fortunately, Chris from QL Forum also sent me some felt pads that he's tested before and those don't accumulate any static electricity. So let's put one of those and um, see if that fixes the tape. Oh, and I just noticed those are stickers to put on the, um, on the micro drives, they're, they're the Sinclair one of the right size, so that's awesome. Such a nice touch to have something like that. Thanks so much again, Chris. And these might have a real adhesive backing. Yeah. So right away I can tell that these are definitely smaller than the ones I was cutting. They definitely look a lot more like the original ones. So let's try that cartridge by formatting it. And yeah, this one formatted correctly, so this is great. It must have been the type of felt that I chose that didn't work very well for this. So how were the microdrive cartridges? I keep hearing reports or horror stories about how they were very unreliable. Initially, I thought I couldn't really address this issue other than seeing that some of these cartridges had their felt pad missing. But once I got the two micro drives swapped and I tried running the word processor from micro drive one, it failed. Sure, it was just a copy of the original, but still, and you know, I know it's just a data point, but it's not encouraging, especially given all the other data out there about failing cartridges. Also, it certainly doesn't inspire me with confidence seeing the message 210 out of 232 sectors after formatting. And in case I thought it was just my old tapes, the super basic book that I was using as a reference, which is one of the big ones written at the time, also shows that same thing, so it must have been a totally normal thing even back then. Reliability aside, how fast were they? I assumed that being a tape medium, it would have to be pretty slow. But since we like hard data here at the Retrolab, let's set up an experiment. I'm going to write a 32 kilobyte binary file to the microdrive and read it back. Then we'll do the same thing with other mediums. The easiest way to do this on the QL is to use the s bytes command save bytes. I'll save the memory area of the screen, which happens to be exactly 32 kilobytes. Oh, 
Okay, that was nine seconds in sum. Those are not decimal numbers that are showing, but frames at 30 frames per second. So really it's 9.3 seconds. Also, did you notice how the motor kept going after the prompt had returned to us and I stopped the timer? That's because the QL does some smart caching and actually it hasn't finished writing to the tape, but it already returns control to the user. I was debating whether to time one or the other, but it makes sense to really time how much time the user needs to wait for the write to complete. But it's important to know that it goes a little bit longer and that, for example, you can't remove the tape while that is happening. And then we'll read it back with the L bytes command. I'll let you figure out what that means. Notice how the screen is replaced with the one we saved. We're loading it back in the same area. And that's 7.7 .7 seconds. Why would we have different speeds writing and reading? The tape moves at the same speed independently of the operation, so that must have been different values seeking to the right place to start the tape, which, if you remember from earlier, it can be up to 7 seconds. Now let's try the same thing, but writing to disk on an Amstrad CPC 6128. I'll save a 32 kilobyte binary file and... Wow, 10.1 seconds. I can't easily read the 32 kilobyte at once, so I just saved two 16 kilobyte files and I'm going to read them back to screen memory one right after the other. And that's 10.4 seconds. At least that's consistent. It's almost the same amount of time as writing a single 32 kilobyte file, plus a little bit more for overhead loading two files, but at least that makes sense. And just for fun, let's try with a traditional audio tape on the Amstrad. Ready? Go! Oh boy, this is gonna take a while. Uh, faster, please. Um, faster. All right, uh, I'll be right back. Still going, Whew. Over four minutes, wow. Now, to be honest, that is not a fair test at all. Sure, I used the default firmware routines in the Amstrad CPC for saving to file, but those are extremely inefficient. You probably heard that it was saving multiple blocks and pausing in between, so we can do a lot better. For that, let's check a commercial game that loads the, one of those introduction screens that are exactly 16 bytes. So that will give us a much better idea what it's like to load that amount of data from tape. In this case, let's load Equinox, one of my favorite games in the system. And yeah, check it out, it's under one minute. Now, it's still way worse than disk or microdrives, but that's a much more fair comparison. So the results are in, and the microdrive is actually slightly faster than the floppy disk drive on the Amstrad CPC. Looking at the specs, it's listed as being able to transfer data up to 15 kilobytes per second, and we're only saving 32 kilobytes. So I suspect that the majority of what we're seeing is actually the time to seek to the right spot to start saving or reading the file, plus just a couple of seconds for the actual data transfer. That means that the longer the files you write, the more difference there would be with floppy disks. Overall, I'm really impressed. I was expecting the micro drives to be much slower than floppy disks, even if the Amstrad CPC disks are not the fastest ones. Very impressive in my mind. So there you go. We fixed the micro drive itself, and we actually learned quite a bit about how micro drives work. In my opinion, they're not nearly as bad as people made them out to be, but they're not as good as a floppy disk drive, for example. I still don't think that's the main reason the QL failed, though. Anyway, if you're interested in the Sinclair QL, check out some of the other videos in the description that are part of QL Vember, and I will definitely be making more videos in the future. I've really enjoyed the system and there's a lot more to explore, so we'll come back and revisit it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.
Sinclair was a name of varying association through the 60s, 70s and 80s. Starting in the 60s, Sir Clive, or just Clive as he was known then, introduced the world to a series of breakthrough microelectronic devices through Sinclair Radionics Limited, out of what was essentially a backyard shed. Sinclair began to produce components for hi-fi and scientific instruments, gradually building up the business, whilst at the same time making ever smaller and somewhat revolutionary devices. However, as the radionics company began to fail, and even with government assistance, he started up a new company, Sinclair Instrument Limited, in August 1975, and launched the world's first digital watch. However, like some of Sinclair's earlier products, there were reliability issues, coupled with a terrible battery life. From there, Sinclair's new company went through a few more name iterations before launching the ZX80, ZX81 and ultimately the Sinclair Spectrum throughout the early 1980s, under the name of Sinclair Research Limited. The Spectrum was a huge success, and really introduced the UK to the world of home microcomputing. However, ongoing competition with Acorn and Commodore drove Sinclair with a desire to break into the professional marketplace. And it's from this place, on January the 12th, 1984, when we arrive at Sinclair QL. The QL standing for Quantum Leap, a name conjured to describe the technological breakthrough. A system aimed at serious home users and business professionals and launched, and I'll use that word very lightly, exactly 12 days before Steve Jobs would announce the Apple Macintosh. Now, you may have noticed from my other videos that I have a particular fondness for obscure and plight bound machines, particularly those which failed to make it in the early microcomputing world. I think it's because of their untapped potential, a lost relic from a forgotten age. Or maybe just because they tried so hard and deserve some recognition. Either way, the Sinclair QL is no exception. In fact, in many ways, it's the leader of the goddamn pack. Now, if you've watched the BBC dramatisation Micro Men, which I wholeheartedly and repeatedly recommend, then you'll know that Sinclair always wanted his products to be viewed as elegant, professional and pioneering. And even though the spec he sold tremendously well, the film shows him somewhat pained that the machine was only viewed as a low-end games machine. Hence his inspiration for the more professional QL. The reality, however, seems a little more murky. In a fairly recent interview with David Carlin, who was the QL's chief design engineer, it appears that although many at Sinclair wanted the machine to be aimed completely at business and professional use, Clive may have seen the machine as just a more powerful Spectrum replacement. And although most decisions were made by Clive himself and Nigel Searle, who was the MD of the business, this slight contention may have contributed to slightly muddled marketing and explains why the machine has a TV modulator if it is a pretty blurry one. In any case, the QL was touted as a competitor to fend off Amstrad, IBM, Apple and Acorn in the professional world. And this is evident in the most famous advert showing Clive leaping over several higher cost competitor machines. He's come up with a computer to rival these machines at a fraction of their cost. The QL was launched on the 12th of January 1984 at £399 by mail order, and when I say launched it was done in true Sinclair fashion, with orders taken immediately on a promise to deliver within 28 days. In reality there wasn't even a finished prototype at this stage, and the first machines began to ship in April at a slow and steady pace. However, due to this apparent rushing, the first machines were plagued with problems. Some had half the ROM plugged into a dongle on the back, others had firmware bugs in a built-in super basic language, and most suffered from unreliable micro drives, which were chosen due to their lower cost over floppy disks, but higher speed than tapes. These problems tainted the initial reputation of the machine, but in reality it just wasn't well suited for the business world. The micro drives were non-standard, the keyboard was uncomfortable, and most people associated its look with the soon to be released Spectrum Plus model, and therefore cast its professional credibility aside. High street sales of the QL began in August 1984, the same time as the QL branded Vision Monitor was released. 
but yet only a few months later the QL's price was halved to £199 if I hope it would lure some more home users. However, given the lack of games available for the platform, most opted to stick with their trusty Spectrums, or just upgraded to the Plus model released later in 1984. You can see how similar the aesthetics of these two machines really are. Internally, the QL is based on a Motorola 68008 running at 7.5 MHz. Essentially, this is a cut down 68000 found in the Atari ST and Amiga 500, with a 16 bit internal architecture but only an 8 bit address bus. Even so, this drastic switch from the Sinclair's 8 bit Z80 processor meant there would be no backwards compatibility with the massively popular gaming machine. This, of course, wiped out a massive opportunity for the machine to have a huge established software collection at launch. The machine sported 128KB of RAM, which was expandable to 896KB with additional expansion accessories, and for storage, made use of the two built-in microdrive units, one essentially for loading and the other for saving work to. Now, although these micro drives were far cheaper than the newfangled floppy disks, especially if you lack Alan Sugar's haggling skills, they were notoriously unreliable until Samsung took over their manufacture, and the data format wasn't even backwards compatible with the Spectrum's micro drive peripherals. So even if you'd saved some documents on your Specy, there was no way to open them on the QL. This really was like pissing over the path you'd just laid for yourself. The tapes themselves, or wafers as they're known, are essentially like tiny 8-track tapes. They hold a 5 meter reel of tape which spins at 30 inches per second against the machine's read-write heads. The entire tape can be spanned within 8 seconds with data read at 15 kilobytes per second. For the QL, each tape can hold 100 kilobytes of data, although this can be increased slightly by spinning through and formatting the tape a few times, which stretches it slightly. Now, to me, this sounds like the microdrive version of punching a notch in a double density 3.5 inch disc to make them high density. A useful but error prone solution. The tape itself only spins in one direction, with the tape brain bendingly reeled back onto itself and spilled through the drive's head 16 times faster than a standard cassette. Two video modes were available, either 256 by 256 with 8 colours, or 512 by 256 with the 4 colours of black, red, green and white, which you will see evident in most application software. Now this screen mode can accommodate an impressive 25 lines of 85 characters. Woohoo! Two custom ULAs were created to handle the video, DRAM and external interfaces such as the RS-232 ports. These were the ZX8301, which was a play on the QL's development codename, the ZX83, and the ZX8302. The ZX8301, responsible for clock timing and the video display, was initially very fragile, and even unplugging the RGB connection whilst in use could fry the chip. The ZX8302 also had its quirks, including only one RS-232 receiver. This meant that both serial ports had to be run at the same board, essentially forbidding the ability to connect a printer and a modem at the same time. An Intel 8049 chip was used to control the rather limited sound output. Unfortunately, we'd have to wait until 1985 and the Spectrum 128K Plus for a proper sound chip to appear in a Sinclair machine. Now, it's common on early machines to see a mess of fixes and rewiring, which are essential to make the hardware operate without glitches. The back of the machine sports two proprietary local networking sockets for connecting QLs in serial. That's if you ever see more than one at a time an RGB out connector, a TV modulator out, two serial ports, two custom joystick ports, and a ROM connector for cartridges and expansion devices. Mine still has this neat little black cover in place. On the right hand side, next to the reset button, we have a micro drive expansion socket. And on the left hand side, we have a peripheral bay that can be used for a floppy disk or other expansions. The case itself is very industrial and angular, a step away from the soft features of the Spectrum, featuring a new type of spongy plastic keyboard which backed onto a membrane and metal fixing plate. 
it's a huge step up from the original rubber keyed Speccy, and would feature on all subsequent Spectrum models to come. I actually really like the feel of this one, it feels deeper than the later Spectrum keyboards and somehow more responsive. Power is supplied through a 9 volt DC brick, similar to other Sinclair machines, but with a new 3 pin adapter going into the machine. Now upon boot of the machine you're first asked whether you're using a TV or monitor display, with Super Basic offering multi window experiences for monitors. <laughs> Upon selection you're then booted into a command line which serves as both the operating system and the basic interpreter. GST computer systems were originally commissioned to write the operating system, but Sinclair instead opted for the multitasking in-house QDOS produced by Tony Tebby, which resided in the 48k ROM. GST's offering was later made available via a ROM cartridge and the object format inspired by them would later be used to create programs for the Atari ST, including First Word the ST's bundled word processor. The built-in programming language Super Basic is command-wise much like the standard Spectrum Basic, although there are no keyboard shortcuts and you have the addition of structure. This means that line numbering can be done away with in place of labels and repetition features, much like QBasic for Microsoft DOS. It's actually the first second generation basic language of this type to be built into ROM. Now, flicking through the massively hefty and apparently photocopied manual, printed even before the machine was made, you can see like the machine, it was clearly rushed. Evident from the number of corrections someone, possibly Clive himself, has made to this copy. But inside you'll find some basic programs to type in and show off to your fellow professional work colleagues. Oh, ah, wow. Ah, the good old days of basic interpretation on boot. This would ordinarily be the part where I talk about the games, but as the QL was intended for more serious use, I'll cover some of the application software first. Now, my machine and most machines came with this delightful Microsoft Office-like box of applications developed by Scion of handheld organizer fame. Oh, which one to pick? Inside there's a choice of Quill, a word processor, Abacus, the spreadsheet, Archive which is a database and Easel which offers business charts and graphics. To load each microtape you simply use Skill and Finesse to uncase it. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Then, plonk it into the first microdrive for loading. A swift boot and the drive whirs into action, delivering you into your choice of application. The software is surprisingly easy to use, and although they don't have the same commands as Excel or Lotus123, they do the job you'd expect for business software. I wouldn't be too trusting about saving my work to those micro wafers though. Hmm. Thankfully, there are a number of games available for the system, and better yet, the dreaded, although quaint, colour clash from the Spectrum is gone. Instead, we're offered what appear to be more colourful visuals, but on second inspection, they expose themselves as limited to eight colours on screen from a palette of 256, albeit with the ability to flash each pixel. This limitation stifles the game somewhat, although clever overlaying can produce more colourful visuals. Anyway, here is the best of the bunch.
Despite not achieving its expected sales, the QL did make some progress into professional and home markets, selling 150,000 units, enough for several companies to pop up and support users who had plunged into the machine. However, it was nowhere near enough to save Sinclair's fortunes, despite being adamant it would. Unfortunately, the video game crash of the mid-80s didn't help, and either did pouring so much money into the doomed Sinclair C5 car. However, out of this innovative misfortune, Alan Sugar's Amstrad stepped up, of course he did, and using purely capitalist-driven skills, acquired Sinclair in early 1986, immediately abandoning the QL. Fortunately, the same companies who supported the machine beforehand quickly stepped up to fill the void, including CST and Dansoft, who created the four line of compatible machines. The original creator of the Linux kernel, Linus Torvalds, actually attributed his operating system breakthrough to having owned the Sinclair QL himself sometime around this era. Being fed up of the limited software array, he decided to write his own, and from there, Linux was essentially born. He then later ported this to PC to meet a somewhat expanded audience. Because of the machine's expandability, new ROMs were created such as the Minerva replacement for QDOS. There were also expansion cards such as the Trump card which added memory expansion and a floppy disk interface. And in the 1990s, two redesigned motherboards were created for the system, offering much more powerful CPUs and additions such as Ethernet and the actual ability to run the Linux operating system. And in fact, some hardware and software is still created for this machine to this day. Pop onto some QL forums and you can see that there's still quite a few people who are making use of what this machine has to offer. This includes a swathe of emulators running on various platforms and even an official successor to QDOS called SMSQE, again written by Tony Tebby. Maybe, like the Sinclair C5, Clive was just ahead of his time with this often forgotten machine. Now I find it surprising that given the reliability issues with a lot of Sinclair hardware, most QLs seem to be in good working order today, although micro drives and their software are more hit and miss. If you're lucky enough to have a system with a Samsung made micro drive, you still need to be wary of eroding felt pads on the wafers themselves. But hey, most of my software seemed to work just fine. So if you've got a spare 80 odd quid, why not pick up a genuine piece of UK computing history and give it a bash? What's the worst that can happen? Thank you for watching my video on the Sinclair QL! I've done plenty of obscure machines in the past and I've got plenty planned for the future. Please click on my video below, contribute to my Patreon if you feel flush, or just get the hell out of here. In any case, thank you very much for watching and good night. Last September, the world lost an icon with the sad passing of Sir Clive Sinclair. Now, it was touching to see so many articles and news reports and tweets from people whose life he touched or changed in some way. As back in the 80s, Sinclair was a household name here in Britain, and his company introduced an entire generation to home computers with his range of affordable home micros. From the kit-based ZX80, the ZX81, of course, the legendary ZX Spectrum range of machines, which sold an estimated 5 million units. Sinclair introduced many people to computers for the first time and video games and programming and helped to kickstart an entire industry here in the UK. But despite all of Sinclair's successes, there were some products from the company that were either misunderstood, underappreciated, or for some reason or another, just didn't hit the mark with the public. Now, of course, I say that, and the first product that springs to mind for most people is the ill-fated Sinclair C5, a small one-person electric vehicle introduced by Sinclair in 1985 and is often regarded as one of the biggest failures of the 1980s. 
But step forward to 2022, and with electric vehicles now being mainstream and accepted as the future, despite the Sinclair C5's obvious flaws, maybe he was just a few decades ahead of his time. And the other major product from Sinclair that really failed to find a market was the follow-up to the wildly successful ZX Spectrum, the Sinclair QL. Standing for Quantum Leap, the QL was launched by Sinclair Research in January of 1984. Now, while the Spectrum was mostly being purchased by families and for kids, the QL was intended to be for small to medium-sized business customers, the educational market, and for home users who wanted a more serious computer than the Spectrum. And it's often been said over the years that despite all of Clive Sinclair's success in the computer industry in the 80s, he never intended or was very comfortable with the idea of having a popular system for games. He really wanted his products to be taken more seriously. This is what my lifetime of achievement has been reduced to. Clive Sinclair, the man who brought you Jet Set <laughs> Willy. Now, the QL was originally designed under the codename ZX83 and was originally intended to ship with an ultra-thin flat-screen CRT display built in but after many revisions and changes, the eventual release version of the QL instead resembled the more familiar all-in-one desktop computer form factor that we saw at the time. And Sinclair's then managing director, Nigel Searle, gave briefings to the media about the new machine. And actually, Nigel joined us last year on my podcast, The Retro Hour, to talk a bit about his time at Sinclair and give some insights into the design decisions of the QL. And I will link up the entire episode in this video's description if you want to hear more. You know, that turned out to be another thing where Clive was desperately trying to develop a product that would appeal to more serious-minded people and games players. And I don't mean to suggest that he didn't have the support of people within the company, including myself, um, because it was still relatively early on. The PC with an Intel chip and a Microsoft operating system had not gotten firmly irrevocably established um, as Apple was beginning to prove and as we thought we could begin to prove that there was a market for something, something else than a PC clone. But what we failed to do was to realize that that market would pay whatever it took for a better quality product that wasn't full of compromises. I've actually got a really nice example of the Sinclair QL still in its box in its original bundle. So first of all, we'll do a quick unboxing and then we'll check out some of the included software and find out some uh, more modern solutions for loading games and applications onto the QL in 2022. And as you can see, I've got the Sinclair QL box, which is uh, rather large, I've got to say, um, on my desk here. And if we spin it around, you can see the design of it is very minimalistic. We have the same thing on both sides, the Sinclair QL font there on the front with a nice picture of the QL in the center there and the Sinclair logo up in the top right. Not much to it, but you know, I think it does the job. It is quite stylish, I think. And then to get into the box, we do have some polystyrene inside here that is actually packed in pretty tightly inside the cardboard. So um, getting this out on camera elegantly might be a bit of a challenge. So um, I'm just gonna try and give this a go to uh, get the inside of this box out on camera. And after about 30 seconds wrestling with the box, we have the polystyrene inside out of it. Now you can see here we do have uh, some, you know, nice little touches here. The Sinclair QL logo is embossed in the polystyrene, but, you know, it is a bit of a cheap packaging, really. But, you know, Sinclair weren't famed for their extravagance. Then if we open it up, we can see that actually, bearing in mind this machine is now over 35 years old, um, everything's actually survived in this polystyrene inlay here. So, you know, it's done its job. It's protected the machine for all this time. And you can see it's uh, expertly packed in there by the seller of this machine, my good friend Marvin Drugsma. So we'll, uh, we'll explore that in a bit more detail in just a moment. And uh, a few additional things that Marvin appears to have uh, put inside the QL box here, including a magic snake or a boing ball construction kit. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, a few other goodies that Marvin sent me in this envelope. But this stuff here is what we would have got in the QL if you bought it new back in 1984. Now we have some uh, blank micro drive wafers in here with uh, some Sinclair branded note paper there. And uh, yeah, these are completely blank. We'll talk more about micro drives in just a moment, but that was the default storage on here. And the uh, bundled productivity applications as well. There are four of these included um, for all of your 
mid 80s office needs and as you can see this one here is a ql easel so i'll uh, i'll try and boot these up and uh, give them a try in just a bit but yeah this packaging is quite stylish quite like the look of those we also have uh, three included little plastic risers or a uh, feet that you could put on the bottom of the ql to uh raise the keyboard up to make it more comfortable to type on a um, bit of a budget solution but you know that worked uh got a few rf cables and stuff you know things that we won't be using here i've got a nice um, rgb to scart cable that i'll talk more about soon we'll put the ql to one side we have some pretty substantial documentation included with the ql <laughs> get rid of all these bits of polystyrene yeah so we'll look at that in a bit more detail soon he yeah, has a lot in here really talking you through everything that you need to know it's polystyrene's getting everywhere uh, and it looks like the back of the polystyrene inlay has broken <laughs> yeah i've got a feeling that was already like that though and here we have the uh, rather weighty uh, ql power supply that actually if you are shopping for a ql make sure you get one of these because it is proprietary and uh it's got a unique connector and these things are actually quite hard to get hold of so make sure that you get a power supply included with yours and the included documentation with the QL certainly is substantial. I've got to say, I think this is the biggest user manual I've ever received with a computer. A massive ring binder covering everything from setting up the machine, the basic commands, how to use the included software. And I've got to say, it is very nice to see such quality in the manual. And this part of the package is definitely up to the standard of a premium business computer. So this is very nice to see. Something that really isn't up to standard though is the micro drives. Now, I think this is one of the biggest reasons that the QL never caught on in the world of business as Sinclair tried to save money by opting for this cheaper storage medium over the more expensive floppy disk. And micro drives were previously available for the Spectrum, although the QL's format isn't compatible with Spectrum formatted wafers, as these little cartridges were called. And these are really just loops of tape inside, holding around 100k of storage. They are a lot quicker than cassette tapes, but the micro drives are notoriously unreliable. So it will be interesting to see if any of these work almost 40 years after they were made. Although luckily, I do have a more modern storage solution in the form of the V drive. Now, this is a modern SD card based micro drive hardware emulator that I'll be connecting up to my QL very soon, and it will mean that I can download all kinds of software onto it. And the QL itself, it's got to be said, is a very cool looking machine. It's got that classic Rick Dickinson Sinclair design, that same sleek black color that we saw on the Spectrum and the ZX81. We've got a full keyboard on here as well, which is actually very similar to the type used on the Spectrum Plus. And we have the two micro drives on the front. Now, generally, the first micro drive would be used to load your application and the second would be for a blank wafer to store your data. There's a reset switch on the right side of the machine and a micro drive expansion under a cover to add additional drives. And there are loads of I.O. ports on the back of the QL. We've got the two proprietary QLAN network ports for networking other QLs, a proprietary power port, RGB video out. There's an included TV modulator in here as well. Dual RS-232 serial ports that quite uniquely use phone jack connectors as do the two control ports for joysticks there as well, so definitely non-standard. And we have a ROM expansion slot, which actually early QLs had an included cartridge with part of the system ROM on here as it wasn't finished on the machine in time. And there's a large expansion connector behind a cover on the left of the machine for floppy drives and the like. And internally, the QL is quite unique. It's got a Motorola 68008 CPU clocked at 7.5 megahertz, which despite the name is actually slower than the Motorola 68K as it's got an 8-bit external data bus and a smaller address bus. Although it's faster than other contemporary CPUs that were around in the mid 80s, like the Z80 or the 6502, it is around half as fast as a 68K clocked at the same speed. And the QL comes with 128K of RAM on board in its stock configuration, expandable to just under a megabyte at 896K. And the machine sold initially at £399 on launch in the UK, soon reduced to just £199. So that's the hardware. Next, we'll get into the interesting stuff. The applications, the games, the demos. We'll get the machine up and running and have a look at all that next. 
And just really quickly before we jump into that part of the video, I wanted to take a quick moment to give a big thank you to this video sponsor, my wonderful mates at Skillshare. Now, they are a massive online learning community where millions of people from all around the world come together to take the next step in our own creative journey. And you can join in too and take part in thousands of classes on so many topics, design, video production, photography, marketing, life improvement, and lots more. And all of them are delivered in each easy to digest parts. And even though I've been doing YouTube for well over a decade, I'm always trying to up my game on here. And Sorel and Morse classes on YouTube success and how to build an authentic channel has so much valuable advice, whether you're starting your own channel or just want to see better results from your existing one. And Skillshare is incredibly affordable, especially right now, you might still be working remotely. It's a great way to learn with your free time and a lot cheaper and safer than pricey in-person workshops. So I want you to jump in and join the Skillshare community today. And actually, I've got you a great offer. The first 1,000 people to use the link in this video's description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So claim it quick and of course, help out the channel. And a big thank you to our friends at Skillshare for their support. Okay, so we're set up and ready to give the QL a test drive. And powering on the system is the first sign of that classic Sinclair cost cutting. There's no power switch on the machine. In fact, the only way to power it off and on is by plugging in or disconnecting the power supply. Now, of course, you could plug it into a switched socket or an extension plug, but I imagine pulling the cord at the end of each day would be a bit of a pain in offices. And the first thing the QL asks when we turn it on is if we want to use a monitor or a TV. Now in monitor mode, you get a multi-window high resolution mode, which is a very nice touch. But for YouTube and to make things a bit more visible, I'm gonna use it in standard TV mode. And like most machines of this era, you dropped straight into basic on boot. That is unless you've got a wafer in a micro drive and then I'll try to boot from that instead. And since we've got these included programs on micro drive wafers, I thought we'd give them a try first. Now Quill is a word processor, but upon booting from that micro drive, it seems that the QL won't load from it at all. So instead I'll try Abacus, which is a spreadsheet. And this one actually loaded up just fine. And we see this nice grid of 255 rows by 64 columns. Now spreadsheets aren't really my thing and they don't make for the most exciting demo on YouTube, but I've got to say this does look very nicely featured for 1984. And it's even got online help included by pressing F1, which is a nice touch. And I'm not sure if it comes across on video, but I'm very impressed with the sharpness and vibrancy of the QL's video output. Now I am using an RGB to SCART cable here, but I've got to say the video quality does look a lot nicer than most of my other 8-bit micros. But I'm sure we can find some more interesting software other than the Office Suite. So let's hook up the V drive and get some software downloaded from the internet. And hooking up the V drive on its own is actually really simple. You just remove the cover from the right side of the QL and plug in the cable between the device and the computer. And as you can see, the look of it matches the QL perfectly. There is a slight issue though with some games that apparently expect to be in micro drive one. And by default, the QL will assign the first device connected to the expansion as micro drive three. But we can get around that using this small device, the VMAP QL, which doesn't need any hardware modification. All you do is open up the machine and plug it over the sockets where the micro drives attached to the motherboard. And then you can assign any drive to any device number. And there are some great resources online, including Dilwyn Jones QL pages with lots of files that you can download. And he's even got a section on there with images already made for the V drive. So you can pretty much plug and play. Now I won't spend too long going over the V drive, but I thought it might be quite cool just to give it a quick demo. And uh, by the way, you'll have to excuse all of the Commodore peripherals I've got connected up around my QL. I normally have my Commodore plus four set up in this space and I couldn't be bothered to clear everything away. So hopefully, no hardcore Sinclair fans are getting too triggered by that. But as you can see, the uh, V drive is connected now and um, I haven't got an SD card in it yet, but we don't need one at this stage. So I'll put it into TV mode again. My usual micro drives just spin up to check there. And now there is actually some uh, firmware on the V drive, a toolkit that you can actually load without the SD card in. So if I type L run M D V three underscore boot. Now see the screen will change color there. The lights are flashing on there. And now we can type in 
help. And it will show me a list of commands that are on the firmware of the V drive. So there's loads of stuff that we can do there for, you know, file and folder manipulation. So uh, yeah, we can look through the list there. And the first thing we want to do is then um, format the SD card to work in the V drive. Now these are standard fat formatted disks, but they recommend that you format it using the V drive just to make sure it's compatible. So if I put that in there now, you can see now it will read it and it's gone yellow and it made a little buzz sound. And I will type in SD init to initialize the SD card. Okay, to initialize it, yes. As you can see now, the light will go red while it formats the SD card. And uh, hopefully then we can load some files onto it. And there we go, about 10 seconds later, SD card is initialized. Okay, so now I've copied a few microdrive images from my Windows PC onto the SD card, and I should be able to just type in LS and get a directory listing. And as you can see there, we have a bunch of uh, MDV files, which are microdrive images on the SD card. So I can load one of these into the V drives, virtual microdrive RAM space. So um, we'll pick one of these here, Pac-Man. Everyone knows Pac-Man. So to load that, we just type in LD3, comma, quotations, Pac-Man. And as you can see, I've made a bit of a typo there. One thing you'll notice is, there is no delete or backspace key on the QLS keyboard. This took me a bit of time to figure out. You actually have to hold down control and the left cursor key to delete. So there you go, little tip. There you go, LD3 Pac-Man. And that should then load it into um, the V drive's memory. So I can type in LV and that will list all of the uh, the V drives that we've got there. So we have the uh, two micro drives and as you can see, MDV3 Pac-Man is loaded. So now to load it, we just type in L run mdv3 underscore boot and that should load pac-man from the v drive and as you can see the uh, led is flickering off and on uh, it takes a bit of time as well i don't know if it's quicker than a normal <laughs> micro drive but it does take uh, a few seconds to load them in and it is making a weird uh, beeping noise as well i think that's meant to imitate the sound of the micro drive but it doesn't really sound much like it and all being well the game should load, and here we are into uh, Pac-Man, the first game that I've tried on the Sinclair QL. Any key to start? And there we go. It uh, doesn't look much like any version of Pac-Man I've played before. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, as I did say in the intro, the QL is not really meant to be a, a gaming platform. It was more of a business machine. So, uh, and I think a lot of these games on here are freeware. But, you know, that is a good little demo. We'll die. Oh, nice sound effects. But I thought that would just be a nice uh, little demo of loading software on the V drive. So we'll uh, we'll have a look at what else is on the QL and uh, try out a few more games and maybe a few demos as well and kind of see what this machine can do. So I must admit, I did have quite a lot of trouble getting most games working on my QL or under emulation. I did read it can be something to do with unzipping files on Windows, causing corruption of file headers. So that's probably something I need to spend a bit more time investigating. But hopefully that little glimpse there of a few demos and games will give you a quick look at the graphical power of the QL. And I must admit, it is certainly more capable graphically than I previously thought. And just finally, because I know this video is getting quite long, if you want a few interesting facts about the QL, 
the mythical Imagine Software game Bandersnatch, which of course became the inspiration for that episode of Black Mirror, which was abandoned on the spectrum when Imagine Software went under, and of course is the subject of the commercial breaks documentary back in the 80s. That game, at one stage, was intended to be released on the Sinclair QL exclusively, and in fact some beta versions of it have surfaced on some QL forums. Now, unfortunately, I did want to demo it in this video, but it needs more RAM than my system's got, and I couldn't get it working under emulation despite spending all afternoon today trying to get it working. But if you do want to download the images and have a look at what this legendary game could have looked like before it was turned into Bratticus on the Atari ST and the Amiga, I will link up that thread in the video description. And the Sinclair QL was the second computer owned by Linus Torvalds, who of course went on to create the Linux operating system. And actually the QL was the first platform he created any operating system for, because apparently due to its lack of software. So if you think about it, if the QL never existed or was more successful, maybe in some alternate universe, Linux wouldn't exist either. Something to think about. So in conclusion, I definitely think the QL is an untapped resource and a platform that still leaves quite a bit to be explored for me and retro fans in general, I think. And there are definitely some impressive titles in its small software catalogue. And if you want to try a modern PC operating system that's based on the QL, there is a really interesting platform called QPC. And you can try this in a massive pack called The Distribution that probably warrants a video all of its own, actually. It's QL compatible. You can also do stuff like surf the web with it, play videos and much more as well. So if you want to give that a try, I'll put that in the video description too. So the QL community and platform, while admittedly very niche, it is fascinating and I look forward to exploring it more. And if you're looking for an untapped retro platform that might have a few surprises, it could be worth a look. So thank you for watching this video. Just a quick reminder that I do a weekly retro gaming and technology podcast. New episodes released every Friday. Search your podcast client for the Retro Hour, ask your smart speaker, or you can download it each week from our website at theretrohour.com. And while you're here on YouTube, here are a couple more of my videos I think you might enjoy. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Today we're going to take a stock Sinclair QL and look at all sorts of different upgrades to take it to the next level. Here I have a lot of upgrades for the Sinclair QL. So let's take them one at a time, install them in the computer, and let's see how they work. Before we get started with the upgrades, I wanted to say a big thank you to this episode sponsor PCBWay, or is it PCBWay? I don't know anymore. Anyway, PCBWay is my go-to site for creating circuit boards for my projects, and they've always been great. If you're interested, check them out at PCBWay.com. The first upgrade isn't so much of an upgrade as it is a replacement. This is a replacement power supply for the Sinclair QL. And uh, the reason we need something like this is because of two things. The connector for the power supply, it's this really weird three pin connector. And the other reason is that the voltages it outputs are kind of weird. So I believe one of them is nine volts DC, which is totally fine. But then the other one is 16 volts AC, and I guess they have a common ground. So that makes it rather odd. This particular one is made by V Retro. So that's uh, Charlie down in New Zealand. The 3D printed case is awesome. It's designed to be in the same shape as the original QL power supply, just much smaller. I have the original one right here. So it definitely has the, it's kind of like the, 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 the baby of the power supply and, and also the weight. The, the original one is really heavy. This one is really light. If anything, it may be too light. The other unusual thing is that this is not exactly a power supply, but a power supply adapter. Um, you don't connect this to mains. Instead, you plug in a 12 volt DC power supply into here, and then this generates the necessary voltages for the Sinclair QL. The button here, I'm not really sure. I guess we'll try. It's probably some kind of reset, moment, momentary reset, although the QL already has a reset, so I'm not really sure what the point of that is. Let's open it up and see what's inside. 
Oh, I think it just maybe had a, a drop of glue somewhere. Right, okay. So very nice and compact. There it says that, the QLPSU 2020 V Retro Design by Charlie. I'm not exactly sure what it does. I mean, I can imagine. Um, obviously, it needs to start oscillating the 12 volt DC into something bigger and then bring it down to 15 volts AC and then do a conversion of the 12 volt DC into 9 volt um, DC. So, yeah, very neat and compact. Oh, let's see, there's a few more screws. The build quality seems really good. Before we try it on the real computer, let's see the output voltages. I want to see them in the oscilloscope and see what kind of um, the quality of those. Are they noisy? Are they not? Are they stable? I imagine they are. I'm just curious to try it anyway. So we need to plug in 12 volts in here. And I don't have a good place to hook up the oscilloscope ground. So I'll probably just touch that and then 15. AC and 9 volts AC are right there. So I'm going to turn it on. And let's see this. This is weird. It's like it's not even connected. So I don't know why I'm not getting any signals in there. Let me just check the grounds connected correct. Oh, wow. So normally on a DC jack, this lead is connected to the outside of the barrel connector. And here it doesn't seem to be connected to that at all. That's super weird, but this is connected to ground. I imagine that's ground. Yeah. So that's fine, but that's not, that is weird. I ended up talking to Charlie about his power supply design. And apparently for this kind of power supply, which is a switching power supply, it's not really necessary to hook up the input ground to the ground of the supply itself. So that makes sense. I was just used to the earlier power supplies from the 80s, the analog ones, where it is necessary to hook up the input ground to the ground of the supply itself. I'm just going to measure for now the voltage. And uh, let's make sure that we're getting the 9 volts. And from this to this should be 9 volts, 0.3 volts. It's clearly marked 9, and this is 15 AC. What's going on? And this is... Am I supposed to press this to turn it on? <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, the light's stead steady now. I guess I should have read the manual before doing this. There we go, 9 volts. All right. Now let's see if I, I, I want to see the uh, 15 volts AC. So I need to hook up the oscilloscope ground somehow. Okay, so it looks like the first cable going to the LED is ground. So I should be able to hook it up right there and connect the oscilloscope probe ground in there. And with this, we can see the 15. So I need to do that. Now I won't forget to push the button. There we go. And yeah, okay, that's looking good already. Interesting how square it is. I'm sure that's fine. And that's clearly an artifact of how that voltage was produced by the circuit. But yeah, that's, that's totally fine for an AC input. It's actually almost closer to 20 volt AC, which I think technically is supposed to be 15.6, but I'm sure it doesn't matter. So, okay. So it looks like it's working. Now let's try it with the computer. Okay, so with everything connected, let's turn on the power supply. And okay, now this blanks. So now that I know that I'm supposed to press the button. And when I do, okay, this seems to light up in here. And we're getting a signal. Awesome. It just booted no problem at all. Very good. So the verdict for the power supply replacement is that you don't need to get one if you already have a power supply. But if you need to get a power supply, I would say this is a very good solution and I would definitely recommend it. Next, we have the upgrade that I'm possibly most excited about of all of them. 
the microdrive emulator. This takes an SD card with images of microdrives and we can plug it into the QL with this cable like so and to the QL and it will act initially I think as microdrive 3. Before we do anything with it as usual let's see what's inside. Oh, interesting. That looks like, what are those, blue pills? Like two of them, too. I wonder why you needed two of them. <laughs> Other than that, there's just not much, as usual. Voltage regulator. What are those? Amplifiers? Of, no. I don't know what those are. I would have to look into it. And, oh, is that already a piezo buzzer? Or is that something else? And then if you want to have more real or emulated V drives or micro drives, you would plug it in on this side. So they all chain off each other. One important thing about the V drive that I didn't realize at first is that it's pretty different to some of the disk emulators you might be used to, like a GoTech, for example. What's the biggest difference? The GoTech has some kind of display to tell you which image is selected and some buttons to navigate the different images and select the one you want. The V drive has nothing like that. No buttons and no display. On top of that, there's another key difference, which is the V drive is not a single micro drive emulator. It's actually a whole chain of micro drives emulator. So how do we use it then? The V drive comes with great documentation, explaining very clearly everything from how to connect the drive to the QL to how to create whole chains of virtual micro drives. A V drive is much more complex than a GoTek, so you should definitely look at the manual carefully. I won't repeat everything here, but we'll go over the basics and we'll run some software from micro drive images. In order to connect it to the QL, we need to remove the lid of the micro drive connector. Then we can plug it into the computer with a special cable. Let's turn the computer on. And yep, yeah, it's working. We see the little green light. When you first connect the V drive, nothing different happens. It's initially mapped to microdrive 3. And if you try to access it without the SD card inside, you see some files. That's what it needs to bootstrap and become usable. For now, let's load it with LRUN MDV3 boot. And yeah, that was really quick. And it loaded the toolkit in memory to let us operate with a V drive. When you type help, it shows you all the commands. Two screenfuls. I told you this was not trivial. You better read the manual. Let's start by preparing the SD card. We run SD init and it formats it correctly and writes a configuration file. Then we can start making new images with the command make image. And running li list images shows us all the images we have in the current directory in the card. An image can then be loaded with the command ld and the microdrive we want to add it to. In this case, I'm adding the Noel 1 image to microdrive 3. And with the LV list V drives command, I can see the current ones. But wait, we're not there yet. Before we can even use that drive, we need to format it, just like a real cartridge. And if I try to load another image, I can't, because the V drive is only emulating one micro drive at the moment. If I want to add another one, I need to tell it to create a new drive. And now I can load it and format it. Phew! But wait, there is more. As if this level of configuration wasn't enough, we can create banks. A bank is a particular configuration of images and V drives. So I could set up one bank for working with the word processor, another for development, etc. You can really, really customize how you want to work with a V drive. So at first it seems a bit intimidating, but once you get started using it, it's really good. You're not limited to using image files you create yourself. You can download MDV files from the internet for different programs, copy them to the SD card, and use them in your QL. In this case, I got a few freeware games, so let's check them out. I tried a couple of them, but they refused to work. I don't know whether the image was corrupt, or they didn't like something about my QL, like the Minerva ROM, or they simply didn't like running from MDV3. But I did find one that worked, Pac-Man or at least that's what it's called. The game itself is pretty abysmal and nothing like the original Pac-Man, but I'm just happy to be able to run a game at all. I hear there's some good games for the QL, really, especially text adventure ones, so I'll have to cover those in a future episode.
For now, let's try running one of the flagship programs for the QL, Quill, the word processor by Scion Software. I tried running it from cartridge before, but I wasn't able to run it properly. And, oh, bummer, same thing. These programs don't like running from Microdrive 3. I need to fix that. I wish we could set the V drive as Microdrive 1. So in order to change which microdrive the V drive is, we can use a V map, also conveniently sold by V Retro. So it almost looks like it's just a cable and some pin headers, but actually there's a tiny, tiny, tiny microcontroller right there. So each microdrive has two ribbon cables going into the main board, and these are usually horrible connectors, but I believe these have been upgraded. So this should be easier to disconnect than the uh, stock ones. So the inner one needs to go on this set of pin headers and back on the board. Yeah, that was really easy. And um, then the VMAP connects in there, but we might as well do that one first. And now the other ribbon cable goes on the VMAP and then the VMAP goes on that connector. So the one with the actual microcontroller is supposed to be in drive A. Okay, that was very easy. And now we just need to put this back in place. There we go. So this just this cable connecting the two, just move that out of the way and put the heat sink back for the moment. The VMAP, again, has really good documentation. In this case, it's pretty straightforward and it mostly comes down to the VMAP command, which chooses a configuration from this table. The default one has the two internal drives mapped as one and two and the V drive starting at three. You can see that by typing V info, and there you go. In the last line, it says VMAP1. That means we're in that configuration. But if we change it to VMAP3, now we have the first two drives mapped to the V drive and the internal ones as drives three and four. So let's check out drive one. Yeah, there's the image of Quill. Let's try launching it again. Now that this is MDV1, it will hopefully work. And yes, it worked. This is the first time I've managed to load this program on the QL for one reason or another. So the V drive and the VMAP are an amazing combination for the QL. There's only one thing that I wish for, and that's that I wish it made some noise while it was accessing the files on the drive. And for that, there's already a solution. Next, let's connect the were emulator or whatever they call it. You know, the, the thing that makes noise on the V drive as you activate it and use it, trying to emulate the sound of a real micro drive. First, let's solder the cables and then we'll figure out where to put it inside of the drive. The instructions that come with it tell us where to solder each of the cables. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, time to test it. Oh, that doesn't sound very good. I know it's trying to emulate a little bit the original sound of the microdrive, but it doesn't even sound like it very much. Let's try it with a real microdrive and compare the two. Yeah, I mean, this is not exactly a pleasant noise either, but it's much better than the electronic high pitch noise of the Whir emulator. Let's compare the two again. I have to admit, I don't like that sound at all. Now, I didn't grow up with the QL and loading things from microdrives, so even the original microdrive loading sound doesn't have any particular appeal to me. So instead of trying to replicate that, what I'm going to do is try to add some audio feedback while the microdrive is active. This is particularly important on a Sinclair QL because unlike other computers of the time, it actually multitasked a fair amount. So it may be doing things on the screen while it's still loading from the microdrive. And that feedback is pretty important to the user. So to see if we can improve the noise that this makes, let's have a look at the signal exactly where we hooked up the, the WER unit, which is right before this resistor. 
Okay, so that looks like variation, but only between five. Not even five. Yeah, five and three volts. So there's like a two volt offset. So I think the easiest way to try the piezo buzzer is going to be to get a couple of wires to ground in the signal. We want to send them to the breadboard and then we can connect the piezo buzzer with these connectors like that. And now we need to solder some wires here. These wires are obviously just temporary for now. If we like it how it sounds, we can come up with a more permanent solution. Okay, and with everything plugged in, let's turn on the Sinclair QL. Okay, so we're not getting anything. We are getting a red light, so we should be hearing something already. So maybe the problem is that the oscillation isn't right for the piezo buzzer. Maybe it needs to go all the way down to zero in order to trigger it. So I'm just going to measure the same thing that we were measuring before, that lead in the resistor. Just going through the breadboard is more comfortable right now. There we go. And, oh, so now we're getting a steady, completely steady five volts. The only thing I can think of is that this particular unit was bringing down that voltage. And then the whole point of this microcontroller really was to generate a um, some kind of um, oscillation given this signal is steady, which you know makes sense. If you're sending that to an LED, you probably want to send and it just looks steady. Okay, so as an experiment, I've set up a very, very simple circuit with a 555 timer. So all this does is generate a square wave on the output I wasn't too picky in exactly the duty cycle or the exact frequency. I just wanted something relatively low frequency so we can easily hear it and it wouldn't be an annoying whining. So I picked, I think it was like 1K resistor, 2K and 10 microfarads. And the output is in pin three. So when I turn this on, so this is not hooked up to the QL at all. I have this hooked up to my power supply. Um, so this is five volts that we're feeding into it. And just for testing, we're going to see the output wave. There you go. That looks totally fine. What's the exact frequency? Let's see, is it gonna tell us? It's about 30 Hertz, that's great. Okay, so let's actually listen to it and see if um, that's what we want. So I'm gonna connect the piezo buzzer and uh, one of them, the one lead will go to ground and the other one to the output of the timer, which is exactly where we were looking with the oscilloscope. And I power this. So that's great. That's a lot less annoying <laughs> than what we had before. Okay, but right now this is only powered by five volts. Let's remove the five volt connection and instead connected to the signal that turns on the red LED on the V drive. So let's turn on the QL. Honestly, that's better than it was before. One interesting thing about setting up the buzzer this way is that we can change the frequency of the sounds pretty easily just by changing the capacitor. So I think I had selected, this was what, 10 microfarads? Yeah, this is 10 microfarads. So let me grab something like 100 microfarads. This should make it much slower, uh, maybe even a tenth. So if the other thing was 30 hertz, maybe there might be three hertz. So this might be like, you may hear more discrete, tick, 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 which it's fine. We're just looking for an audio feedback. So let's give this a try right now. There you go. That's. That's pretty nice. That just tells you, hey, I'm on. I like it. So just for fun, let's try a different one. I've turned this off. Let's try 47 microfarads. And that should be something in between the two. Let's see. Yeah.
Yeah, I don't know which one I like better, actually. <laughs> this definitely has more energy to it. Like, it makes you think, like, yeah, 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 the micro drive is definitely doing stuff. I might go with this one. I had some of this prototype board, and it just I didn't have a neat saw, so I just snapped half of the board. So I did this arrangement, thinking about how the resistors need to be and where things are connected. The output would be right there. And then I'll hook up ground there and um, five volts, well, not five volts, but the activation signal uh, there to F. Okay, so there's the final result. I had to add this little cable to connect reset to VCC. Let's actually test this. I've already soldered the wires in place. Now let's hook up the piezo buzzer. There we go. That's perfect. The last step now is to hold this in place. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a bunch of hot glue there and then put it on top. The hot glue is not conductive and neither is this, so it should be perfectly fine. I just need to hold it in place for just a little bit. And there you go. So for the piezo buzzer, it really doesn't matter. It's not really conductive. It can be loose in there. Um, I thought about maybe putting it under the board. Maybe that would work. So we could leave it loose like that. Or let's see. That would hold it more in place. Yeah, I like that. Okay, time to do the final test. Yeah, much better than before. I like it. And so these upgrades, the V-Drive by itself is pretty good, but once you combine it with the VMAP, it's simply a must-have upgrade for the Sinclair QL. The war unit, skip it completely. You can either make your own like I did here or look for alternatives, but that one is definitely not worth it. Mike over at 8-Bit Retro Journal is quite the Sinclair QL enthusiast, and he's going to be publishing a series of videos about adding sounds to the V-Drive. So definitely check out his channel. I put a link down in the description. Well, that took a lot longer than I expected, and we ran out of time. So we're going to have to save the rest of the upgrades for another episode. It's actually all the upgrades that go inside of the computer, so that should make a nice theme for it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up as usual and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.